Financial Capability for Youth and Child Welfare presentation. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Ms. Christy Stankovich. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's or this morning's webinar, wherever you are from. And I would like to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is being recorded. We will have one interactive polling question, and at this time, all phone lines will open up, are muted and will open up for Q&A towards the end of the presentation. Um, attendees will be able to address any question by phone or via the, the chat questions pane feature on your GoToWebinar. Um, if we are unable to address any or all questions, we'll be answering uh, the remaining questions in a handout after this webinar. At this time, I will turn it over to Matt Hudson of the Capacity Building Center for States. Hi, thanks, Christy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Matthew Hudson, as Christy mentioned. I'm the Program Area Manager for Youth Development with the Center for States. And today, we're going to learn more about how to use the Financial Empowerment Toolkit uh, to build the financial capability of youth transitioning out of foster care. Um, you'll see our larger overview on the screen for you. Um, and then to get started, uh, we're going to just do a brief um, overview of what our agenda for today's presentation is on the next slide. So we're going to start with just really brief introductions, and then we're going to go into an overview of the child, uh, Capacity Building Collaborative and the Capacity Building Center for States, followed by an overview of the Financial Empowerment Toolkit, and then some information on fi financial capability and child welfare, and then we'll follow that up with a question and answer period at the end. So moving on, in terms of brief introductions, I already mentioned my name is Matt Hudson and I manage the program area of youth development. Also presenting today, you're going to have Lynn Wright, who is a program area advisor with the Center for the Youth Development Area. We also have Kim Lemke, Minnesota Independent Living Coordinator, who will be presenting after the overview of the Financial Empowerment Toolkit. And then for those of you who uh, were in attendance at the first webinar in this series, uh, Corey Hadamer, Associate Director of Savings and Financial Co Capability with the Corporation for Enterprise Development, will also be available during our question and answer period to, ask, uh, to help answer any questions anybody may have about uh, relating the information gained in the first webinar that she presented um, with the information that you're learning here today. Next slide. So in terms of our webinar objectives, our ultimate goal is that we're going to, uh, participants will hopefully um, be able to use this financial, and cap financial empowerment toolkit to help you youth build financial capability. More specifically, during this webinar, we are hoping that participants will be able to gain um, a deeper understanding of how financial capability is included in programs serving youth and child welfare. Discuss the application of tools related to engaging youth in financial capability programs. Share uh, experience providing financial capability services. Discuss the financial priorities of youth. Identify services that may help youth build financial capability. And determine how they can use the Financial Empowerment Toolkit to provide financial capability services to youth. And with that, we'd just like to move now into talking a little bit about the Child Welfare Capacity Building Collaborative. In October 2014, IACF International was awarded a contract by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families Children's Bureau to establish the new Child Welfare Capacity Building Collaborative. The Center for States, the Center for Tribes, and the Center for Courts are partners in the Child Welfare Capacity Building Collaborative which consolidates services that had previously been provided by National Child Welfare Resource Centers. This consolidation increases coordination, leverages resources, and provides more strategic pr uh, service provision. Our goals are to work with partners and jurisdiction to support capacity to lead to improved outcomes for children and families. Next. We do this by partnering with states, territories, tribes, and courts to identify, design, and implement innovative solutions that meet the unique needs of each jurisdiction. And lastly, in this overview, 
is the Center for State specifically, which is um, the branch that's, that we work with and who is providing this webinar today. And the Center for State serves state and territorial public child welfare agencies in Title IV-E waiver demonstration jurisdiction. Maggie Bishop is the Center's Project Director. ICF International supports the Center for States. You might recognize ICF from our work with the Child Welfare Information Gateway, as ICF has a long history of working on technical assistance contracts with the Children's Bureau and other government agencies. The Center for States aims to provide evidence-based, capacity-building support services that will improve performance and support states and territories in effectively initiating, implementing, and sustaining change and innovation. To achieve this goal, we work with our partners to create and deliver coordinated, inclusive, and well-informed capacity building services. And with that, we can get to the meat of our presentation today, and I will turn it over to Lynn Wright to discuss the Financial Empowerment Toolkit. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Matt. Um, I would like to uh, first address how this uh, financial Capability Toolkit came about. The National Resource Center for Youth Development uh, partnered with a team uh, with the Corporation for Enterprise Development, also known as CFED, and uh, partnered with the Children's Bureau. And uh, this was about a year ago, a little bit more. We've received a lot of good reviews and uh, have a lot of interest. So we wanted to share with you how this can help the child welfare agencies prepare older youth for their transition to be more empowered over their financial matters as young adults. Um, basically, uh, uh, building this capacity is, is considered a, and demonstrated by the Administration for Children and Families as a critical aspect to supporting the vision that they have for children, youth, and families, um, and individuals and communities who are resilient, um, safe, healthy, and economically secure. So um, this financial capability is a concept that was developed out of the need to talk about something a little bit broader than the financial education or financial literacy, which were uh, common terms used. So, um, well, as an example of that, someone may be educated about financial concepts, but if they're unable to access safe, affordable financial services, which uh, youth and foster care often are limited to that, uh, they're not able to act on their own knowledge. So financial capability is a framework for taking a broader approach to laying the foundation for economic well-being and stability. So um, the knowledge and skills involved in building financial capability overlap with many of the other uh, elements of this uh, life skill competencies that are involved in uh, preparing youth for adult life after foster care. And so oftentimes the... Um, uh, consideration for options to enhance decision making and um, postponing gratification, practicing behavior change, managing resources, setting goals, those are all life skills that uh, can also uh, integrate with financial uh, education and financial skill building. So one of the, um, uh, I guess, approaches or strategies that we would like to try to encourage agencies to use is to integrate financial capability concepts across the board and integrate them into programs, uh, protocols that you're already using in your programs. Um, there are increasing complexities and availability of financial products and the impacts that they have in all aspects of our lives are important for us. So we all really need to become a little bit more financially savvy and capable. Technology's changed a lot, the way people do banking and credit, and it's also made us um, a little more vulnerable to identity theft, or at least we feel like we're more vulnerable to identity theft and other financial risk. So the increased influence of credit scores and the availability of commercial products have made it a, a little bit more critical and important that we take a more comprehensive approach to achieving and managing financial security for young people who will be exiting on their own. Um, and it falls, uh, again, upon the child welfare systems to ensure that these skills are taught and practiced and that youth um, are prepared to put those skills into action when they leave care. Uh, this often has been happening through life skills instruction provided through independent living programs across the country, 
so we really thank and welcome all of the independent living coordinators that are attending today. We have nearly every state in the union represented here, or uh, I would say a substantial amount. Um, but we would like to propose an alternative strategy to the often isolated and sporadic attention uh, that addresses financial capability um, and, and suggest that a more comprehensive approach that would be more effective to equip young people with the skills and tools they need to navigate the financial systems and become financially secure as adults. So integration of key components throughout the various supports that are already a part of your program service delivery can really help maximize the impact of your efforts. And we want to do that by helping you um, providing this guide as one of the tools that you can use to um, help do this. What you're seeing on the screen now is a cover of the Financial Empowerment Toolkit uh, for youth and young adults in foster care. So this is what it looks like on the outside. The toolkit cover includes a photo of a person using a calculator and completing financial forms. It's a substantial piece, 33 pages, including an introduction and background rationale. It offers strategies, some useful tools, um, <clears throat> excuse me, resources, <clears throat> and references for use in program development. Excuse me just a moment. Not a time to lose my voice. Okay, <clears throat> I hope I can continue. I'm, I apologize. This toolkit's designed to provide caseworkers, independent living providers, congregate care providers. We have foster care, uh, resource parents, and other supportive adults with strategies and resources to um, be able to critically evaluate and improve their current um, approaches to financial capability. It's designed for those working with youth under the age of 18, starting at 14 and also young adults over the age of 18 or who are preparing to transition out of the foster care system uh, who may be in extended foster care or supervised living arrangements. Um, but it also can be used by other um, entities, runaway and homeless youth, uh, youth involved in the juvenile justice system. It can be adapted, so it's very useful. Um, we hope to... Um, have you utilize this in your program development and in practice to more methodically choose and integrate new strategies in the program interventions and to improve your financial capability. Um, what makes this publication useful is it is comprehensive, and as I said, it applies to other service fields, uh, but the elements of financial capability are focused on child welfare. The concepts and tools in this example are directly related to supporting financial capability among youth and young people in foster care and the, the special circumstances that um, are, are challenges faced by young people that do not have parents as cosigners, do not, will not leave and have uh, uh, family support to fall back on. So the examples and the strategies used really target and focus in on their needs. So um, as you navigate the toolkit, you'll find background information on the financial capability field, an explanation about why financial capability skill building is needed. I think we all really have a good understanding of that. Uh, information about the target population and the barriers that youth in foster care face but um, also very useful for you would be the assessment tools, planning tools to help with execution, and a lot of tangible resources. Uh, the toolkit contains three main sections and three appendices. Uh, we have a section on the importance of financial capability for young people. Uh, cover the financial capability concepts. It explains how core financial capability concepts apply to youth and young adults transitioning out of care. Um, we have a, a section on service delivery strategies, which talks about how to seamlessly integrate financial capability into programs that work with young youth and young adults in foster care. The appendices um, include tools. There is uh, there are tools that are targeted to youth and young adults. 
uh, tools that are targeted for uh, caseworkers that directly work with youth, programs that work with young people, and uh, supportive adults uh, to integrate these financial capability strategies. All stakeholders that work with young people um, uh, are the target of these tools. Uh, we also have uh, in the appendix, uh, appendix two, learning styles. It discusses the theoretical educational concepts that are important to consider as programs formulate their financial capability integration strategies. That's intended for all audiences and is a really good, strong uh, rationale for uh, how, to, how these approaches were, uh, came about. So we can move on to the next slide. Financial capability, as we know, is a critical step towards financial security, and we propose that it takes a combination of knowledge, skills, and access to attain financial capability. Um, we would like to offer a definition of financial capability as um, it can be defined as capacity based on knowledge, skills, and access to manage financial resources effectively. Um, Johnson and Sheridan in 2007 uh, proposed a definition of financial capability that's also really appropriate. It is the ability of individuals to understand, assess, and act in their best financial interest. So based on this, uh, there, there still are many people, regardless of socioeconomic background, that may lack one or more factors of this financial capability equation that, that you see up here. It takes all three of these to bring about capability. And while the tools focuses on capability, it's important to recognize that other strategies play a role. We all understand that. Uh, as an example, a requisite aspect of financial capability includes financial education so that individuals have the knowledge of budget strategies, understand the importance of credit and credit scores, and, um, and how they work. But financial education by itself is really not sufficient to ensure sound financial footing. So um, one example uh, would be to know about banking products um, and what does that uh, that does not ensure that, in practice, the young adult will be able to manage a bank account to avoid the overdraft fees. So they really need to uh, have opportunity to practice these skills, and not just through simulation or in uh, uh, games and learning tools that are offered on the Internet or in group classes, that they need. Young people really need the opportunity to have hands-on experiences um, normal opportunities to venture out to the institutions, to meet financial experts, uh, to actually um, get the feel and feel confident about that they could do this on their own. It's to enable them to, to learn how to, to go out and uh, manage for themselves, to make decisions. Um, but knowledge and skills together uh, is is very important, but if they don't have access to the resources, and I don't just mean access to get to the resources, but if there are not financial products that are youth-friendly or um, that can engage youth in actually being a part of an account, whether it be a savings or a checking or any financial uh, service or product, then uh, they're not going to fully develop those skills until they're out on their own. And we would really like to encourage states to um, partner with, reach out to the community, find uh, financial institutions that um, can understand the value and the need that young people in foster care have and uh, as far as co-signing and the, the challenges that they face so that the, the, there is true access to those resources out there. It takes all three of these to reach financial capability and um, uh, that, that's the goal, is to make sure that in the work that you do, that you are covering these three bases before the youth step out on their own. Okay, so the next slide will cover the underlying principles to the premise of this toolkit, mutual goal setting, simulations or experiential learning opportunities for youth, and community resources.
These principles, we feel, should be embedded in the agency goals and include education for staff and providers as well. Policy could outline expectations that are embedded in daily life of providing the services to young people in case management, assessments, home visit notes, court reports. Um, uh, make sure that these concepts, these tools are, are part of every aspect of the daily service delivery to young people. You can determine how to hold professionals and caregivers and youth even accountable for the progress. Um, as I said earlier, starting with simulations, whether through a computer or animated products, lessons, um, often at teen conferences, those are wonderful ways to gain knowledge, but we need to involve youth very early in uh, transition planning, goal setting, uh, even by the age of 14, they need to be uh, purposefully focused on how financial matters and credit impact their lives, exploring the values and desires and, and their interests to set these goals and to uh, get them to understand that it relates to money and that they need to be beginning to budget, manage time, and use their skills in the financial world as well as in their adult uh, social settings and their job skills. So um, the next slide is uh, the financial capability core competencies. Uh, Financial Literacy Education Commission, also known as FLEC or FLEC, uh, developed a set of financial education core competencies to uh, which provide a simple framework or a baseline for understanding what people should know how to manage financial affairs. The five core competencies are earn, spend, save and invest, borrow, and protect. Financial capability core concepts and the application to programs that work with youth in foster care. Uh, core competencies and financial capability. Um, in 2011, the, the Financial Literacy and Education Commission developed these, this set of uh, core competencies, and it is um, integrated into some of the uh, school system uh, education curricula and um, is really basic to the main features of the things that you need to ensure that the young people have um, in understanding what youth, including youth in foster care, should know about managing money to enhance their financial well-being, but also staff and uh, the providers that work with young people um, really need to have a good understanding, at least a basic understanding of these, uh, and be competent with them. Um, with each of the core competencies, there are a number of, uh, of elements. For example, under the concept of earn, and I think we can go on to the next slide to give an example of uh, what we mean by um, the core competency and earn. We, we provide this for each one. Uh, I guess we're skipping earn. We're, we're moving on to spend, but we have one for each of the five core competencies. But an example of the competency of spend, the knowledge that a young person would need would be to know how to prioritize spending choices given available resources. Uh, they would need to uh, have input or receive knowledge about long-term versus short-term implications of their spending habits. Um, the action and behavior that one would expect uh, or be able to assist them with would be to set their financial goals, um, get the uh, youth to talk about what their interests are, what their goals are, and help them set realistic financial goals. Uh, uh, and a competency in that area would be they should be able to track their spending habits, develop a spending plan, and live within their means. Uh, part of that's comparison shopping and understanding the effects of their spending decisions. So they should be allowed to uh, make some mistakes that won't be devastating to them, but uh, and to review what the, those mistakes mean and did they learn from them and what might they change. Opportunities that uh, child welfare agencies and the staff that work with them can provide would be, as we talked about, simulations on spending plans. There are many of those online, uh, good, reliable um, 
ones that are in our resource section that we could recommend. Post-transition spending plans, their simulation impact of, of mismanaging funds, and uh, teen grants as opportunities to comparison shop and, and so forth. Um, another uh, area of competency, next slide, that we provide in this guide is uh, borrow. So again, you see the knowledge, the actions and behavior, and the opportunities and examples under that for borrow. So we do this with each one of the competencies. A three-column chart is depicted on screen, outlining the topic of financial borrowing. The three-column headers are labeled knowledge, actions and behavior, and opportunities. The information in each column is identical to the information surrounding the topic of financial protection, which will be addressed on the next slide. The next one that we provide in this demonstration is protection. Um, identity theft is really important, and uh, under protection, the knowledge that the young person, uh, a basic knowledge would be, uh, if you borrow now, you pay back more later. That's a concept that may not be understood. The cost of borrowing is based on how risky the lender thinks you are, and that depends on their credit score. So that uh, is where you bring in um, the importance of, of building good credit history and finding out what your credit score is each year, beginning as early as uh, required at the age of 14. We need to be collecting their credit scores. And uh, actions and behavior, we would expect them to understand how and when to use credit, to be able to shop around for loans and to decide what's best for them, to understand their credit report and their credit score. Um, some opportunities would be to use realistic simulations again, buying a car, discuss how to shop for credit. If, they're, if they do not have funds coming in, still these uh, simulations can be very effective, the next best thing. If they don't have access to, to money, we can certainly go through scenarios with them on a regular basis uh, to make it as real as we possibly can. Work with youth to read credit reports and resolve errors. Um, this is a struggle that a lot of uh, states are facing, is not only getting the reports, but then um, ideally we would love for every young person from the age of 14 on to be able to sit down with someone who can help them understand their credit report, the usefulness of it, the importance of it, so that when they move on their own, they're able to uh, have that habit of accessing it yearly, looking it over, and checking it twice. But um, as it stands, most states are struggling with even just being able to bring those credit reports to the young people who actually have something come back on a report, which means something needs to be resolved. So um, if you have the opportunity to review these with the young people, it's important to be able to understand it yourself as, a, as the person working with the young people. So again, Opportunities uh, would be based on the training and the knowledge of those people that are working with the young person. So I think we can move on to the next slide. Part of, uh, of what is in the toolkit is a section on service delivery strategies. Uh, this would include uh, uh, comprehensive information on integration opportunities, integrating it into your program, uh, provide steps to integration, examples on how to integrate uh, the opportunities into your existing program, and financial capabilities in practice. Um, those sections are, um, are very valuable. It would be a luxury, for, again, for programs to be able to devote immense resources to the focus on developing youth capability, but at, we understand the reality is that programs that work with youth have many other outcomes they're required to achieve, and understanding that service providers need to think very strategically about how they're going to integrate financial capability work, how that work relates to their mission and their vision, and what barriers youth in foster care and people who are helping, the professionals who are helping the, the young people with respect to financial capability. 
service providers may even want to consider how their own colleagues, in addition to the youth they serve, can benefit from financial capability services. In many cases, a provider we know um, feel often feel financially capable themselves or um, may be a bit uncomfortable advising youth and young adults in transition, um, not just in understanding that credit report, but just in talking about how credit impacts getting an apartment, getting a job, um, and uh, how savings can can really impact their their confidence and their ability to continue to save, just putting back a little bit each day. Many of the of the professionals working with youth take on significant work on their own, but they may need to seek out some outside training. We're finding, especially in understanding the credit reporting, uh, that special training is needed to become optimally effective. Once decisions have been made about the strategies uh, that you want to include in your program, the program uh, needs to have a concrete plan for how it will deploy the resources to reach specific objectives. This section provides really good information uh, to service providers with guidance to develop a customized plan. So um, that's a very, a very critical piece in this, in this toolkit. The knowledge and skills of providers and staff um, and service providers with guidance, it provides guidance to develop a customized plan for integrating financial capability strategies. So it's very customizable. You can take pieces of it and integrate it, or you can just take the whole, uh, the whole guide uh, toolkit and use it as it is. Financial capability integration opportunities is another important section, and there are tables that offer program outcomes. Uh, that f uh, focus on outcomes and focus, and then the uh, financial capability integration opportunities offer examples like identifying the gaps, determining unique financial barriers, um, identifying partners within the community, and uh, the resources to customize your integration plan. Um, identifying partners is uh, very critical um, in many aspects. When you bring in partners, they are experts at what they're doing and what they know, and it relieves a little bit of the stress from, uh, from the staff that may not feel comfortable sharing this or developing a curriculum, a new curriculum. And there are organizations in every area that are very willing to come in and help uh, and don't have um, a an objective of selling a product. They just have an obligation to come in and provide information and to uh, provide education to groups so they can work with staff, they can work with young people at teen conferences or on a regular basis through a series of uh, educational seminars. Okay, so um, ideally implemented in a manner and in a time when it directly connects with another need being faced by the young person um, is really uh, important. Consider the timing when you're reviewing your young person's goals and their, their hopes for the future um, and you're trying to adapt these lessons. It's really important to find something that they really are interested in and a need that they have and that's a good time to address these, these issues. Um, we have a table in the, uh, in the guide that can support youth to attain the outcomes in each of the areas. It, it's a good starting place to think about how to integrate financial capability strategies. Um, there, is, there are columns of program outcomes and focus and another column for financial capability integration opportunities. So you can take an outcome focus such as em employability and then you can adapt that to how that capability integration, uh, what opportunities they are to integrate that. You can review the credit reports to improve employment outcomes, checking credit reports and resolving issues um, and things like that uh, that are related to employability. And the table goes through several different outcomes, and uh, uh, along with each outcome, you have examples of, a, of an integration opportunity 
specifically related to the child welfare field. So um, once you're looking at the guide and you can review these and see these, it'll become a little bit more clear. I wish we had um, a page, every page of the guide to review as I'm reviewing this, as I'm talking about it. But I think that it will all come together once you have the, the piece in front of you. Um, another section um, covers steps to integration, and it has a uh, small amount of detail on program orientation and assessment, uh, program design, and program tactics and to-do lists. So uh, that's a, a very important section as well. Finally, there's a section on financial capability in practice. And this table offers resources by level of intensity for each of the five core competencies that we mentioned. Um, so uh, it outlines a variety of potential financial capability integration strategies that are organized by each of the capability core, concept, core concepts. As you proceed down the table, each row of, of the strategies requi requires more resources and more intensity to integrate it into your program. So it's, it's very, um, you, you can take it and apply it to specific needs that you have in your program and the level of, of need that you have and the intensity that's needed to deliver to the young people. And it would help you really um, arrive at a, a more customized integration plan. Next slide. Um, using the tools, there is a section of the toolkit that uh, offers an assessment. Uh, there's a section on leveraging partnerships with financial institutions. goes into more detail with some uh, recommendations. Um, educational theory, so that it discusses the different approaches and how they all work together to really build on the knowledge and experience as well. But you have group settings, you have individual settings, you have uh, daily life settings, and all of these um, need to be working in, in conjunction with one another to really strengthen and reinforce what the young person is learning. Um, there are models of financial education delivery offered in this, and then a section on resources. So um, I wanted to uh, review or just briefly highlight uh, one of the tools. is um, It's a worksheet, How Ready Are You to Work with Youth? And it reviews some of the questions that you can consider uh, when you're developing these to, to find out, sort of assess where your staff are and, and what kinds of uh, educational and, and skill development are needed there before they begin to reach out. Uh, this is a tool to really identify the gaps uh, of your own financial knowledge and pinpoint the resources so that you can uh, include these in training courses, uh, whether they be specifically focused on financial education or whether it becomes part of your core, uh, core training. Uh, another section that is really important is the uh, collaboration, and it's devoted to leveraging partnerships. Uh, we're going to hear from some other folks today about how they leverage partnerships and um, funding and other resources that they receive from, from partners with uh, lots of knowledge and tools. Um, the contributors of the toolkit recognize that some members of this toolkit's audience may not feel comfortable about their own level of financial knowledge, as we've discussed. And um, so conveying financial concepts to youth and young adults really is a challenge. So your expertise in working with youth and young adults, you are not expected to become a financial expert. We need to highlight that point. This toolkit uh, is intended to arm you with a host of tools and resources and uh, reaching out to the community partners to help you spot financial issues and uh, fill in some of those gaps and uh, take some of the responsibility off of your work schedule. That's, uh, we, know, we understand how very important that is. Um, the resources identified in the Appendix 3 of this toolkit um, will help you locate partners that can assist you with financial capability skills building, 
how to leverage your partnerships, uh, even uh, credit, taxes, and insurance tips, uh, and how to directly communicate with youth about filing taxes and so forth. I think we, yes, these, uh, the Financial Empowerment Toolkit, part of the addendum was the development of um, tip sheets for directly uh, designed by uh, or in collaboration with young adults with experience. They helped uh, put these together, and there are five of them addressing the different key important areas. These are directly uh, targeting the youth audience. Uh, if the staff can take these and uh, understand them and then take them and review them with the young people uh, as the need arises, uh, they are very, very effective. What you're going to see on each of these as we go through them is just the cover. Some of them are a one-pager, some two and three pages long. Some of them also have worksheets that the young person can actually use to fill in and track their progress. Um, this particular one is for uh, addressing how the young person should interpret the credit report. The title of this tip sheet is Know Your Credit History, How to Interpret a Credit Report. This one is really key for uh, staff as well. Um, it helps the staff really understand what is on that credit report and what it means and how they can go through it to, with the young person to help them understand it. It even talks about resolving uh, issues. The next one, the next uh, tip sheet designed for young people is about taxes. The title of this tip sheet is Get Tax Savvy, What You Need to Know About Taxes. Uh, what you need to know about taxes. There are um, a lot of misunderstandings about uh, earnings and who should file and who should not. And are they employees or are they independent contractors? And this covers uh, the basics of that and also uh, has resources where they can go and find out more and find out details. And it's really very easy to learn more click a button, and even go to the IRS website and find out some more tips. But this is the basics. And uh, we are finding that a lot of our young adult consultants and, a young, and young adults who participate in panels and so forth um, really lack a clear understanding of uh, how they should be filing their taxes and even uh, filing for uh, credits and benefits. So this is a very useful tool. The next one is... Um, uh, protecting yourself. This is really addressing the ID theft. So to protect yourself and your stuff, what you need to know about insurance. So it's not only on ID theft, but it's what are the basics that they need to do to insure uh, an automobile, to insure their uh, personal belongings in their apartment. And there are some worksheets and some uh, special tips that are featured in this one. Uh, the next tip sheet for young people is creating a credit profile, uh, how to build your credit. This one really uh, gets to the issue of the moves that they make um, in their credit, building credit, overdrafts, um, too many credit cards, uh, and, and the balance between their credit and their income, it, it addresses a lot of those basic facts in very simple, to-the-point uh, uh, information. It talks about secured cards, secured loans, borrowing, and um, how they can get accounts, co-signing, and that sort of thing. So that's, it talks about the importance, too, of the impact of a credit score on the other aspects of their life and how important it is to uh, build a history and, and build a track record that you are a reliable individual that you can support, uh, that you can be relied on to pay your bills, to rent, pay a car loan, that sort of thing. So it's really a, a powerful, I think, tip sheet. And the next one is the one that's about identity theft and how to resolve the errors.
The title of this tip sheet is Identity Theft, How to Resolve Errors on Your Credit Report. And this is particularly important for those of you who are uh, getting those credit reports back, and it gives you very simple, very important, critical, easy steps to what you should do. It even also uh, has a section that addresses the challenges, the emotional challenges that young people in foster care face if they need to file a police report against a family member and, and the considerations they have there and the alternatives. Uh, this is a very, very important piece and very relevant to those of you who are working with the young people who have something that come back on their credit reports. So I say this is, this is key. So uh, next, the next slide, we have, um, there we go, um, financial empowerment, the gaps that we see across the uh, states. There are a lot of states that are doing a lot of good work, um, and we have uh, invited some to attend the webinar today, and we have a presenter today that's going to share what they're doing. But some of the um, issues that we've noticed that uh, we really want to focus in on and help address are things, uh, agency culture uh, and the fear and the anxiety that goes along with uh, financial capability. And the fact that I mentioned earlier that it's, it's piecemeal, it's here and there. You offer classes at teen conferences or um, in schools, but it really needs to be something that is integrated across every aspect of what they do. Foster parents need to be engaged, your providers need to be engaged, caseworkers, and the courts, so that uh, everyone is making sure that the five core competencies are addressed in daily life and that people are asking about it and following up to make sure that they're progressing towards them. So. Um, uh, another, and that uh, applies to the next, uh, I jumped ahead a little bit, to the next uh, little feature, which is purposeful integration. Um, and that's what I was talking about there, is, is make it a point to include these core competencies in your assessments, in your court reports, in your daily checklists for your visits with your, uh, with your youth, your monthly visits. And... Uh, Consult with the judges and, and have them make sure that they're asking the important questions about the youth's progress and in, in their financial capability goals. Um, targeted life skills questions. Make sure that, uh, that these questions, again, are in your life skills assessments and that they are part of the next, the next square is they're part of the youth-driven transition plan and and that uh, you not only explore what goals the youth have, but you help them uh, determine whether they are reasonable goals, are they realistic, and how they're going to get there. And in that consideration, you can't avoid finances um, and how they're going to budget their resources. So, uh, and the other element is uh, that's lacking a lot is recognizing the teachable moments. Um, if, if it's integrated across the program, it doesn't become a burden. If it, there's a piece of it in your checklist for your home visits and a piece of it in your uh, assessment uh, and it just permeates everything that you do, then, then you're making sure that you're covering all these necessary components. The other, the other important key that uh, is seems to be, um, needs a little bit of strength, and that would be to start young. You can start as young as two and three in teaching the concepts of grati uh, postponing gratification, managing resources, uh, making decisions about need and desire. Um, but as early as 14, young people need to be really engaged in relating finances to adult life. Um, and they need to be getting those court, re uh, not court reports, but their credit reports every year starting at age 14. And eventually, if you can work it into your program, use these as teachable moments. 
Um, and as I said, the next one involving courts, again, get with your court improvement plan um, and your post adjudication boards and make sure that uh, questions, uh, that they're asking questions of the young people um, right in the court, at the court hearing. Are they progressing? What do they, uh, what are their plans for the future for earning and budgeting and do they have an account and do they have access? And the other element is having youth be accountable uh, for their progress and their learning. Um, diverse approaches. There are a lot of suggestions in this piece, but there are also other states that have developed toolkits and guides and documents and that can be shared. And there's a, a, a lot uh, out there that can be customized to the needs of your population, know your population's needs, know your young person's needs and where they are in their understanding and in their knowledge. And the next issue, which is really uh, highly important, is that I think we didn't uh, show the diverse approaches little box. And then the next one uh, that's a really important is it's often a challenge for young people to really have hands-on access when they don't have an income or tangible assets or they can't get their hands on on the uh, funds that are coming to, to them. If they are able to manage these funds before they're out on their own with a little bit of guidance and a little bit of oversight, it will certainly help them when they leave care. So if you can de devise ways in your policy to get money, the money, the checks, the credit cards, debit cards directly in the hands of the youth and help them be able to budget that before they leave care. That's an immense help. All right. Uh, actually, this is Matt. I need, to, I need to pop in just for a second before we go to our polling question. Um, we had forgotten to, to mention uh, before, but to everyone that can, uh, is, has access to their webinar pane on the right side of your screen, we have this PowerPoint available to you as a PDF handout um, underneath the tab for handouts. So I wanted to let you know that for anybody that, wanted to, that wants to follow along or look back with something that Wynn just talked about, you can access it there. Also, those images of the toolkit and those tip sheets, uh, the link to view those is embedded in those images, so you can just click on them. But really, the reason why I'm popping up is because I wanted to let you guys know that for some reason, those links aren't working right now. The tip sheets and the toolkit that we're presenting on right now are available in two places, and that's the Children's Bureau website and the Child Welfare Information Gateway. And right now, both of those are not working, but I have... Um, let people know, and so those should be working soon. So just the two quick notes is, one, you can follow along with the handout provided on the right side of the screen in the Handouts tab, and then two is if you're not able to access it, I'm having the same issue on my end, and we, we're hoping that it will be fixed soon. <clears throat> Sorry, Lynn, didn't mean to throw off your vibe there. That's okay. That's, a good, that's good timing, and I appreciate that, yes. Yeah, because it, 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 is, uh, it is quite a... Um, a toolkit that is uh, you need to get your hands on and you need to go through it and it's I think it's really exciting and very very useful um, and I, I want to say you know after covering some of the gaps that we have I, I want to also note that the field is not void of innovative practices around building financial capabilities there are a lot of states and jurisdictions that have supported programs for young people to advance financial capability very exciting things happening um, particularly for youth who are exiting care on their own. And uh, we have match savings, financial education curriculum being developed, work groups, coaching and mentoring programs. And we're very happy to have uh, the uh, states, the independent living coordinators here today and hope they chime in later. But we also are very excited to have someone here today that will present what they have going on in their state. Uh, before we turn it over to Minnesota, we would like to... Um, ask uh, the audience to chime in a little bit. Uh, with the credit reporting requirement, many states are struggling with the administration end of the accessing these reports, negotiating with credit reporting agencies and batches, et cetera. So um, with the federal requirement uh, beginning at age 14 now, we'd like to know if 
in spite of these of all the challenges that you're facing, is your state or agency using credit reports as a financial capability tool or in a teachable moment? So if you could respond to one of these, we are using credit reports for all youth in care over 14 years of age. We're only using credit reports when an issue is identified, or we are only able to obtain credit reports for some youth, or you can respond with none of the above. And all you need to do is just select one, and we'll tally the responses, Let's see what we have with our pool of attendees. Hi, Lynn. Pardon for the interruption. We have about 50% who's voted thus far, so we can wait just a few more seconds. Good. Okay. Okay, so um, about 65% are using credit reports for all youth in care over 18. Wonderful. Um, uh, and then it, it's pretty equal down there about we're only using credit reports when an issue is identified. Uh, and from my uh, information that I've received from the states, that's uh, some of the larger states with the larger populations. Uh, some are only using it to able are only able to obtain credit reports for some of the youth, and then we have about 13 percent, uh, none of the above. We'd love to hear from you, um, and if you have uh, uh, comments and want to elaborate on that, we we really would appreciate hearing from you. Um, so uh, this is this is very interesting. It is a current challenge for many of the states and. Uh, could really be an opportunity for a future discussion among some of you, uh, a phone call or something. I might remind you that we have, uh, we're launching the cap share uh, for Chafee leads and ETV leads, and it will be a place where we can engage in some of these discussions at a later date. So uh, keep, uh, uh, keep your patience with that. We've got about half of you on uh, the, the, this group site, and as soon as that gets filled up, we'll be launching that and have a place to share all these discussions. So I know that you want to hear from your peers, so we have planned an opportunity for participants who wish to share during this webinar. Um, after we hear from Minnesota, we have invited Kim Lemke with the Minnesota Department of Family Services to talk a bit about the program there. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Kim. All right. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so I briefly wanted to talk about Minnesota's efforts to build financial capability. Um, we have six different things that I'm going to talk about, and the first three are really for our general population, so they can be utilized from anywhere from youth all the way up through seniors. And then the last three that I'm going to talk about are specific to our foster youth. So the first one is Minnesota Financial Literacy Interagency Work Group. So what this is, is we have 10 um, state agencies that are participating in this work group. That's the uh, Minnesota's Department of Commerce, Department of Corrections, Department of Education, Employment and Economic Development, Higher Education, Housing, Finance, um, Human Rights, Human Services, Military Affairs, and Revenue. So the, the focus of this group is the following, um, to increase communication and collaboration across the administration in order to improve and expand existing financial literacy programs, and also identifying new ways um, administrative-wide uh, partnership may help ensure Minnesotans from kindergarten to retirement have the skills, knowledge, and resources they need to achieve financial security. And we have designated in Minnesota that April is Financial Capability Month, and so we do activities specifically in that month as well. The next one is Your Money, Your Goals for Social Services Toolkit. And Minnesota was a pilot project with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And this is a training that's designed to equip and empower frontline staff with the tools and resources needed to help their clients build skills managing money, credit, and debt. The Minnesota Department of Human Services offered this training to all child protection, family assessment workers, and parent support outreach workers. And they did this 
uh, via three on-site um, trainings and also one webinar to try and get as many staff as we could. The third one is the Four Cornerstones curriculum. This was developed through a federal grant given to the Minnesota Department of Human Services and along with uh, Lutheran Social Service and it teaches economic empowerment skills and financial knowledge using a learning circle group method. The next one is credit reports. So now this is specific to our foster youth. And just so everyone's aware, with Minnesota, we are a state supervised, county administered state. So um, a lot of our hands-on work is actually the counties and the state um, develops the policy for that. So what we did is um, at the department, we have the responsibility for maintaining agreements with three credit reporting agencies. So that's TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax. And so quarterly, we submit batch reports of all youth in care between the ages of 14 to 17 who had their birthdays during a quarter and were in a continuous foster care placement of 30 days or longer. So as you can see on the screen, we have um, the credit reports quarterly listed that were run. A sample report provides a data table broken down by quarter. The column headers are ages of youth, number of youth submitted, credit issues, civil judgment, collections, inquiries, and other issues. Once we run these reports, um, we notify the county and tribal agencies of the agency or the youth who were submitted during that quarter, and then we provide them with the credit reports for that youth. So each agency that has a youth that was run, they will get three separate credit reports for each youth from each of those agencies. Um, and we, we send that information either in mail, especially to our larger counties who have lots of youth um, that are in care and they receive a lot of credit reports, or we also um, send encrypted emails to the agency. So the slide shows a summary of our quarterly credit reports that were submitted, the number of youth um, with credit issues and the types of issues. And I just wanted to note that when we started running these, we were very surprised with how many youth really did have credit issues. We weren't expecting that many. Um, so you can see um, when we first started, that was obviously just the 16 to 17 year olds. And now that we've started running the 14 year olds, I mean, we've almost doubled our our number of youth that we're running. And then as far as the county and tribal agencies' responsibility for youth under 18, um, once we send those credit reports, and we send the credit reports whether the youth have issues or not, so that they should be using those credit reports as those teaching opportunities to review the credit report, and just so youth know what they look like and what to look for, um, even if there aren't any issues on it. But if there are issues on the credit report, then the, the agency then needs to work with that youth to get those resolved. And then they should also be documenting that in our SACWA system. And as far as youth over age 18, um, here at the department, so at the state level, we don't work with those youth. That's left to the county since 18-year-olds and older can get their own credit report. So we just expect the county and tribal agencies to assist those youth in getting their own credit report and then going over that report with them and again helping them if there are any issues that come up on their credit report. The other piece with the credit report is we do have some online videos um, that people can use that kind of go over the responsibilities um, as well as, you know, just educating everyone on how to do the credit reports. So the first one is actually for caseworkers to review so they can see what their responsibilities are. Um, and the second one is for youth in care so that they can understand their credit. Um, so with the caseworker, one, you can find that one on, it's the University of Minnesota website. We, were, we partnered with them, and that can be found on the Center for Advanced Studies and Child Welfare website. The full title of this resource is Caseworker Responsibility and Credit Reports for Youth in Foster Care. The resource is available online at http colon slash slash z dot u m n 
edu slash credit worker. And the understanding credit um, for youth. The full title of the resource is Understanding Credit, an online training for youth in foster care. The resource is available online at http colon slash slash z dot u m n dot edu slash credit youth. And so our, our next um, opportunity to work with youth is we have um, grants with 15 nonprofit agencies across our state to provide independent living skills for either current or former foster youth ages 16 to 21. And a lot of them do independent living skills groups, which includes money management groups. So they, they are working with our youth from anything with credit reports, um, budgeting, helping them get a checking or savings account and that type of thing. And then lastly, we have not only our, our grantees that do the groups, but also our county case managers work with our youth one-on-one, -on -one, whatever their issue might be. Um, again, helping them understand their credit report, um, getting a, a savings account, going shopping, learning how to, um, you know, comparison shop and those types of things. So that is what Minnesota is doing in our efforts. So thank you, and I will now turn it back over to Matt Hudson. Hi, uh, thank you, Kim, so much. I think that's really great information. I, you, you did such a good job covering it quickly, but I mean, it's so um, it's so awesome to see just like what you're able to do with the youth in your state. And I hope that our audience um, found it useful too. Uh, what we'd like to do now, just moving on, is uh, we'd like to come to move into our questions and answers space. And so there's two ways that we can that that you as participants can ask questions. The first is um, that if you on your uh, the right side your your webinar uh, panel, um, just as there was a, a a tab for handouts where you can access the PDF of this PowerPoint, you there should also be a questions pane or a chat pane. You can t actually just type in your questions if you'd rather do that than uh, read it than 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 join by uh, by audio. And I will read your question to the presenters and get you the information that you need if it's available. Um, you're also able to um, uh, we're able to unmute your phone so you can ask questions of the presenters. Um, but for that explanation, I'd like to turn it over to our uh, uh, um, our operator for those instructions. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Again, press star 1 to ask a question. And there are no questions on the phone at this time. And I don't see any either. Uh, Lynn had mentioned uh, too that there are several states um, that are listening in. I would actually welcome um, for any state that, if, even if it's not a question, that might like to offer uh, an example of something that they're doing, you could follow the same process, uh, the Star 6 process, to uh, speak on the line. And we'd welcome information that you'd be willing to share too. Okay, this is Lynn, and and I I do see so, that someone has a uh, uh, few people have raised had the raise their hand feature selected. Um, can you help with that? Do they need to still instead press star one? Star one at, to queue up for the phone. Yes. Okay. And so, we do have a question on the phone. Okay. All right. A voice prompt on the phone line will indicate when your line is open. Please state your name before posing your question. Hi, this is Allison Schuler calling in from Hawaii. Hello, hi, Allison. Allison. Yeah. Hi, hi. Yeah, Lynn had asked me to share just a little bit um, about our what we're doing a little bit here, so I'll try to do that quickly. Um, but thank you, everyone on the call. I think this is such an important thing, and it's so exciting, like many people have said, to see what's been going on. Um, so just, just briefly, what we've sort of been doing in Hawaii is we work with the Jim Casey Initiative, and I just want to acknowledge that a, a lot of Jim Casey sites are probably on the call, so they also have um, a wealth of knowledge about what's been going on and are great resources to talk to. Um, 
The two things that we've been doing that might be helpful for people um, is, one, our Opportunity Passport Program, which was created by the Jim Casey Initiative. And that um, program is a match savings program. So basically what happens is for the youth, we do eight hours of financial literacy training um, in a classroom setting. But then I think like a lot of people shared, you know, just the financial education is not always enough. And a lot of times you really need something to um, solidify the actions and actually following through with working with financial institutions. So what we do after that is we help the youth open a bank account. Um, at our site, it's Bank of Hawaii, and we have a really good relationship with them. Um, I think that's a, that's a critical relationship for sites to maybe have is to work with, you know, local bankers and create that relationship um, so that when we do go to the bank account opening with the youth, you know, they know somebody at their branch, they talk to them, they see them in person, they know that they could potentially go ask questions of them later. Um, and then what happens is once they've opened that account, um, they're allowed to put money in and we match it. Each site, in each Jim Casey site is different. We do it one for one. So if they say 500, we match 500. And we do it for purchases that make sense developmentally. So, you know, when you were 18, your parents helped you get a vehicle or um, a security deposit and first month's rent or educational expenses if you need a laptop for college, um, health care. And then one of the most recent ones, and Lynn, you mentioned just the importance of credit reports and being able to correct things, is we've started, um, Jim Casey approved that we could start using the funds to help with credit repair. So, you know, if somebody has um, a bill in collections or they have an outstanding loan with a college and they can't get their transcripts, we can help pay off that. Um, so I do think, you know, I think that takes a, lot, a little bit of legwork for other sites to set those up, but it match savings is a possibility. And then we're starting off with financial coaching, um, which, again, you know, if you have a relationship with a local bank, it's, it's pretty great because you can sort of use that um, in terms of getting your financial coaches. We're getting ours from Bank of Hawaii, and it's really just a volunteer-based, one-on-one time for a kid to ask um, or a youth in care to ask any questions that they may have about financial things. You know, I think a lot of times it can be intimidating to to ask these questions, and so in a one-on-one -on -one setting it can be a lot easier. And then that also, you know, the coaches also help prompt goals. You know, where do you want to be? You could be here. You know, this is a place you could be, and, and I believe in that, and let's think about ways to get you there. So... That's a little bit about what we're doing, and um, I, I guess in terms of funding, that's always the question. It, our funding is all private funding, and so we have reached out to several um, foundations for, for grants here in Hawaii. Um, but anything else, Lynn, that you think would be helpful? Okay. Hey, Allison, this is actually Matt. I have a follow-up question, if I, if I could. Yeah, sure. About you mentioned that sometimes the funds can be used for uh, to dispute um, or uh, you know take care of a, one of the incidents that's on the report if they were uh, um, a debt owed or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the instance, and I think this is something that that states have seen. I don't know what level of frequency, but that the issues that are on the young person's credit report are due to a biological family member or someone not them using their social security information to to do that. Um, is there discretion in when it seems like something where the money should be spent on that as opposed to helping the young person with filing like uh, for David it's a forgery with the banks or some of those other processes that would need be? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I think that in general the first, you know, the first line of defense is always trying to get that corrected personally because we – um, I haven't seen a lot of those. I don't know if other states have, so they may be better able to speak to that. Um, but I don't think we've seen a lot of that here. A lot of the debts have been, you know, the youth got a credit card and or, um, you know, the car, the car loan became too much, that sort of thing. But we definitely would look first to correct that. And actually, I think that's where... You know, our, like you said, our knowledge sometimes can be limited in that. We can do the best that we can, but um, I think having that relationship with either a banker or um, somebody that the kid knows, so like a financial coach, it's it's great to be able to have that so they can go to them for that assistance. 
So, yeah, that would be our first line. But most of the ones that we've seen have been debts that the youth have incurred themselves, just just out of mm-hmm. misunderstanding usually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's often for um, for a little older population, is it not? Uh, in it Hawaii? is, yeah. yeah. So yeah. those young people who have not uh, attained a, an adult status yet who might have a, a, a something on their credit, um, there, there's a step-by-step process where they have to p- place a fraud alert and they complete mm-hmm. identity theft affidavit and all that. And if they, if the relationship is tenuous and they're wanting to, you know, reunite, it, it becomes a, a real touchy issue. And in those Absolutely. instances, yeah, financing that just to pay it off and clear it up and start fresh is is an option if you have, uh, like you said, the funding there mm-hmm. to be able to do that. Yeah, we definitely take it on a case-by-case basis. So each situation has different contexts mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Allison. That, that is um that was really great info also. Um, and so for Kim, uh, Corey, and Lynn, uh, and all three of you, I'm not really sure which one of you might have the most information, but we did have a question from one of the participants that says that the credit reports that they receive do not include, square, uh, do not include credit scores. Um, is that an mm-hmm. issue? And then I would also add, if you know, is that something that is a, a contracting issue with the, the TransUnion Experian or um, Equifax? I would like to uh, divert to other states. The credit score is different, so different than the credit report, and you often have to pay for the credit score um, unless you're going through some sort of a loan or something like that. Uh, Does any other state have any comment to that, any experience? This is Kim from Minnesota. So mm-hmm. we we do not get the credit score. That is a, a separate um, mm-hmm. feature or function. So that is not something that we have done. We just strictly stick with the credit report. Mm-hmm. Okay. And this is Corey with CFPD. Um, so yeah, the if you pull your annual credit report for free, the only the the report is available. You have to pay for the score. Mm-hmm. We've seen some organizations actually use some of their funding, their project based funding, to pay. To pull that um, with clients, and so, but yeah, I don't know that anyone can access it at no cost. I think you have to find additional funding for it. Mm-hmm. Um, I would, I would mention too, and I think this goes a little bit. You know, I think you know, Lynn did such a good job talking about you know, and a lot of the gaps that you know that we look with in financial literacy, literacy involves doing some of the same work with individualized work with the young people. So not everyone's going to come from the same situation, but if you know, in terms of the credit score aspect, I know that a lot um, of uh, companies, be it auto loans or credit cards, are now offering the credit scores free, mm-hmm. you know, to their lendees. So, um, you know, even even just myself, I know I've had a loan for a long, or excuse me, I've had a, a, a lender for a long time and didn't, they didn't offer that before that they do now. So I think that might be a trend that's coming. So for those young people you're working with, if they still have the accounts and, and they're active, um, then that and, and they're seeking their score. That might be a free option for them to to get it. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, so I just <clears throat> thought I I would mention that. Um, we also have another question, and uh, Corey, this might be something that you can relate to, or Lynn. I think it relates a little bit to also to what we talked about in our in our first uh, webinar last month. Um, but it, it's about um, any states that are saving um, participating in. Um, saving SSI benefits to dedicated accounts for foster youth uh, beyond the, the federal limit. Mm-hmm. And we had a little bit uh, smaller of an audience last time, so I didn't know if, Kim, that you've dealt with SSI benefits for matched savings accounts, or Allison, you mentioned a matched program there in Hawaii. And just basically, if any one of our presenters or, or anyone had information about, about that aspect, the SSI aspect to the matched savings. Mm-hmm. This is Corey with CFD. I don't know of anything in particular, but um, I'm happy to check with our Assets and Opportunity Network team who keeps track of those things more closely um, and see if they have any information. Yeah. I, um, to my knowledge, they've raised the, the, uh, the cap pr- to pretty high, and it is um, – I'm not sure if it's a matter of once you reach that amount, if you can actually buy uh, or spend it down, of course. But if you're buying assets that are 
uh, you know, long-term assets, they might also count as as the same thing and still put you in an in, you know, in, ineligible for for certain things. So I, you know, that's one of the things that's really touchy and reads really needs to have an expert address that particular issue. And it would be great to have a a at a glance tip sheet about that across the board because it's it was really a question, a common question that we have. Great. And we had a comment from the audience too going back to the credit score issue. Um just confirming too that the, this person said that even just their their bank account, they have a they uh, they bank with a big bank and even on their just banking account now that they're offered their credit score, um, though for the young people they're not able to get it as well. So I think that that becomes. I think what the answer kind of seems like to the person who asked the first question about we're not getting them and, and is that an issue? It doesn't seem like that's an issue in terms of being able to offer assistance to remove incidents on the credit reports because those that you can obtain for free, you can still then work with. Um, I do think there's sometimes a value in having a credit score because um, I think that it's valuable for the young people to know what it is so that they have an idea of, you know, are, you know how credible uh, are they in terms of uh, uh, lenders. And I think that provides teaching moments is that uh, being able to work with you to know what that cre what it means to have that credit score and, and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that if you're interested in that and if, if, if the youth that you're working with or the program is, it's important for you to have that information, I think you'll just need to work with the young people like what is the bank that they're using, uh, what kind of accounts do they have that are in good standing, and is that something where they can inquire whether the, whether that can be provided to them for free? Because I, I think we are seeing that as an option, but I don't think it would necessarily prevent uh, work being done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's very, um, Inger Giafrida has a, a, a piece of curriculum that is very interesting in that it reviews every move that you make and, and how it affects your credit score. So even closing a can, closing a, a, a credit account can can give you a little bit of a drop in your credit score, and something else can raise it up. and And it's really interesting to go through that uh, learning process and really see how your behavior and the things that you do that you don't think are related can really change your credit score. And it's it's very impactful. Yeah. Um, we maybe have time for one more question. I don't see any in the chat. Um, if anybody wants to send one in in the next few seconds, I think we can do one more. All right. Seeing none, uh, I will say, you know, we've got a, a, we've got a little bit more information that I'm going to share with you. Uh, in these next few minutes, if you do think of a question, to send it in any way, we will uh, get a printout of all the questions that, that were asked and answer any that we didn't have the time to get to. Um, and so please uh, please go ahead and submit them even, even if we're going to move on from answering them. So Christy, next slide, please. Um, we want to thank everyone so much for attending uh, both this webinar and the first webinar in this series if you were able to attend that last month. Uh, we know that this is such an important issue for uh, for those that we're working with, not just because of the federal requirement to obtain the credit reports, but just because in general there's so much value for the young people having um, all the aspects of financial capability, um, you know, or as much as they can by the time they age out of care. That being said, we understand that, uh, that there's there's no way for us to give as much information as there is or to answer any question that people might have. That and so saying that. Um, our contact information is right here. <clears throat> Myself, uh, with a uh, program manager for the Center for States, you can email me any questions at uh, matthew.hudson at icfi.com, M-A-T-T-H-E-W dot H-U-D-S-O-N at icfi.com. Also, Corey, uh, if you didn't attend the first webinar, she did an awesome job on another uh, tool. It's called the Financial Capability Planning Guide. Um, and so you can contact her for any questions you have, too. She has a wealth of information. Her email is uh, khatemer at cfed.org. So that's K-H-A-T-T-E-M-E-R at C-F-E-D dot O-R-G. And then Lynn Ryan, who did uh, the presentation today on the toolkit, um, and her email is uh, L Wright, that's L-W-R-I-G-H-T at O-U dot E-D-U. And then also Kim from Minnesota, 
DHS, she's their independent living coordinator, and her email is uh, kim.lemke at state.mn.us. So that's K-I-M period L-E-M-C-K-E at S-T-A-T-E dot M-N dot U-S. And so those are us as presenters. If you'd uh, like more information, <clears throat> next slide, please, Christy. Uh, we also, our uh, ACF contacts uh, and our, uh, who we work with to get the information for this and develop these guides over the last couple of years, that's Catherine Heath at the Children's Bureau. And her email is Catherine.heath at acf.hhs.gov. So that's C-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E dot H-E-A-T-H at A-C-F dot H-H-S dot gov. And then also Gretchen Lehman, who is also with ACF but works for the Office of Community Services. And so she oversees the Assets for Independence and works with Corey and others at the Corporation for Enterprise Development. And so her email is Gretchen.Lehman at A-C-F dot H-H-S dot gov. And that's G-R-E-T-C-H-E-N period L-E-H-M-A-N at A-C-F period H-H-S period G-O-V. With that, um, just closing notes, I uh, again want to mention that if you're still uh, watching the webinar, listening to me right now, and you can see the webinar panel on your right, and you're thinking to yourself, are we going to get a copy of these slides? Uh, the answer is yes, they're already provided to you on the right side of your screen. Look for the tab that says handouts. There should be a little num numeral one next to it. You click the plus sign, it'll pop down with a link to, to download the PDF. You can download that and then all the slides that you've seen today are available to you there. In that, in when you see the images of the Financial Empowerment Toolkit and the tip sheets, the link is embedded in those, so you can click or you might have to control click them uh, to get there. If you're having trouble finding that here in this presentation, that's absolutely okay. We will also be sending it out to all participants in a follow-up email. Along with that PDF, we'll also include just a, um, a link to the um, Children's Bureau website that has these documents available. And for those of you who are still trying, um, I apologize, the link hasn't been working, but uh, the, those people who manage the websites are working on it right now. Um, also, in the follow-up email that you will receive, we will be attaching a survey, and we would really appreciate it if you could provide feedback to us on how the, you felt this webinar went and how our presenters did. And with that, um, again, the, the Capacity Building Center for the States thanks, thanks you so much. We hope this was valuable. We look forward to ha hearing any questions or comments you have uh, based on them and hopefully to presenting more information to you in the future. Thank you so much. For more information, please visit the Capacity Building Center for State's website at https colon slash slash capacity.childwelfare.gov slash states. This does conclude today's conference. We thank you for your participation.